Hi, Paul here from Easy Composites, and in today's video I'll be demonstrating how I've made this high temperature carbon fiber wing mold suitable for curing prepreg carbon fiber parts using a resin infusion process. The resulting mold that I've got here has excellent dimensional accuracy and thermal stability, and it's suitable for service temperatures of up to 160 degrees C. In this tutorial, I'll talk about the purpose of this type of mold, the type of reinforcement that's needed, and how to position this onto the pattern, including a method of making an invisible tackifier. We'll then set up the resin infusion lines and consumables and run the infusion with the EL160 high temperature resin system. Finally, we'll look at the curing and post curing before trimming and finishing the mold ready for it to go into service. In advanced composites, a lot of the processes required to make components require a high temperature cure, be that in an autoclave or an oven. Therefore, the mold tools that you use to create these parts also need to be able to tolerate those temperatures. The main options that are available to you for these high temperature molds are machined metal, prepreg, hand laminated and infused tooling. Metal tooling, most commonly aluminium, is often used for smaller high volume molds and it does offer excellent durability and accuracy but comes with the disadvantages of higher costs and also relatively high thermal expansion. Prepreg tooling, most often made using carbon fiber prepreg, is definitely the most common type of high temperature tooling that you'll find in the industry. Whether this is an out of autoclave system such as Xpreg XT135 which can be cured under vacuum in an oven or more conventional tooling prepreg like our XT180, which needs to be cured at high temperature under pressure in an autoclave. It offers excellent dimensional and thermal stability, but does come with relatively high material and labor costs. It also limits you to only a few pattern maker materials. Most commonly, that's going to be epoxy model board. Hand laminated molds using a special high temperature epoxy gel coat and resin or paste are definitely the most accessible option. Generally, these will cure at room temperature, meaning that almost any pattern making material can be used, including 3D prints. The disadvantage of these systems is that they will offer reduced thermal stability and do also require a degree of skill to ensure that you don't get any defects in your molds. Lastly, and the subject of this video, is to resin infuse the molds using a specialist resin system. The resulting molds will share nearly all of the advantages of prepreg molds, so will have excellent durability, accuracy and thermal stability, but it comes with the added advantage of a lower temperature initial cure and can prove much more cost effective. I know that not many people are aware of this process, so I'm really looking forward to taking you through it in detail. Getting started on the project itself then. The pattern that I've got here is for the upper wing skin for a small VTOL UAV drone that I've been working on. Now I've machined this from epoxy model board, but that's because I intended these patterns to make prepreg tools. In fact, I have already taken some prepreg molds from these. Um, but if I was designing these just for this resin infusion tooling method, I would have gone for the less expensive polyurethane board. Um, in fact, this lower temperature process does mean that many, many different pattern making materials would be suitable, whether that's foams or MDFs, as long as you've sealed and finished them as you normally would, they're going to work. Now I've finished the pattern as you normally would, so I've put down six coats of S120 board sealer to seal the surface, and then followed that up with six applications of Easy Lease to ensure that I'm going to get a good release from the pattern. Pattern. One other thing that I would say about this particular pattern is that I haven't given myself much room around the outside. As I did design this pattern for prepreg tooling, I didn't leave as much perimeter as I would have ideally done around the edge here for positioning of the vacuum consumables. It's going to be perfectly possible to do, it'll just be a bit more of a squeeze than I would have chosen. The first thing that I'm going to do now is just apply the sealant tape around the edge. I'm doing it at this stage because there won't be any stray fibers that could compromise the seal. We're now ready to start laying the reinforcement directly onto our pattern. Now you could at this stage use a gel coat such as our EG160 and this will provide a highly polishable and repairable surface to the moulds but it will come at a slight compromise to its dimensional accuracy and stability. The reason for that is that the gel coat is unreinforced and so it expands and contracts at a slightly different rate to the main tool reinforcement and that can lead to slight pulls and warps in your mould. So you can see here that this flat plate that we've got 
is slightly out of flat. It's got a slight bow in it, and that's caused by the gel coat pulling against the surface on that side. Now, in the case of molds that have got a lot of compound curves and shapes, that isn't likely to cause a major problem or major inaccuracies. And so for cosmetic applications, you might well choose to use a gel coat because of the advantages it brings to your mold surface. But for dimensionally critical ones such as this, it is better to run your carbon right the way through to your tool surface. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And that's what you will generally see in aerospace and motorsport applications. So the reinforcement that we are going to be using is our 210 gram 22 twill, which is quite a lightweight reinforcement. Now it's a good idea to use a relatively lightweight woven material like this on the surface of your mold, as it will give you less print through than if you used a heavier one with more crimp. And so you're going to get a much flatter surface to your mold. Now the reason that we're using carbon fibre as opposed to less expensive glass fibre is down to CTE. So we want the expansion of the mould to match the expansion of the part we're making. The part's going to be made out of carbon fibre, so in having a carbon fibre mould as well, as this heats up during the cure process and then cools down afterwards, it's all going to happen at the same rate. So we won't get any pre-releases, which is going to lead to much truer, more accurate components. Likewise though, if you were making glass fibre parts, you might also want to make your mould from glass fibre to again match that expansion rate. This 210 gram twill has excellent drapability and will conform to surprisingly complicated shapes. In the case of this particular pattern, I could definitely get away with laying all of the reinforcement into the mould dry like this, and then just relying on the vacuum to help me position and consolidate it into the mould. But if you've got vertical surfaces or complex shapes, it might be necessary to secure the material onto the surface. Now, the traditional way to do that is to use a composite spray adhesive. Spray that over the surface and use the tack to position the reinforcement. Now, that's absolutely fine. If you're working on the back of a gel coat, it won't cause any problems at all. But if you're going directly onto the surface of the pattern, like we're doing here, it will leave a slight residue on the surface that won't fully combine with the resin and that will leave slight imperfections in your mold. It might look absolutely perfect when you first release it, but the moment you use a solvent to wipe it or run it through a heat cycle, that residue is going to lift out of the mold and leave those slight irregularities. Now you can work those out. You can sand them out with 1200 grit wet and dry, seal them over with an S120 sealer, and you're going to get a good mold out of it but we've found a little trick that avoids all of that hassle, and that's to use some of the resin that you use in the infusion itself as your tackifier. Now, a fresh mix of resin isn't tacky at all, but if you wipe a thin film over the surface and leave it for two or three hours, it will then get to its B stage, and then it does provide a good tack and would allow you to position the material. Another little trick that I've come up with is to take a mix of the resin and hardener, and just before it starts to cure, actually inhibit the cure by adding two parts of acetone. And that gives you a solvent solution that can be wiped over the surface. As soon as the solvent comes out, you've immediately got a tacky surface that can help you position. Now, if there's enough interest in the exact details of how to make this, it might even warrant its own video. So just let us know in the comments section below if that's something you'd like to see. The tackifier only needs to be added to the more complicated areas. Generally, this is going to be around any sharp corners or features. Wiping the solution is probably the most convenient method, but it can also be stippled with a brush or even sprayed through a spritzer bottle. After a few seconds of being applied, the acetone will evaporate out, leaving a tacky but repositionable surface. When you're laminating a mold tool, there's a lot less to consider in terms of fibre orientation and cut positions than there would be if you were doing a component, because structurally it's not that critical. If you do need to put a cut in certain areas to relieve it, to let it get into corners, it's better to do that, because really what you're looking to avoid is any bridging in corners. Just make sure that the material's got freedom to move down, and you can patch up any areas like this with small pieces of reinforcement however you need it. Using non-woven mat in complex areas and corners in the geometry can be a really useful way of ensuring that you've got a good amount of carbon reinforcement down in those areas. And then from here, when you lay on the subsequent backing layers, they'll have to follow much less sharp corners and you're much less likely to get very resin rich areas. With our first ply down and our intensifiers done with the non-woven carbon, we can now go on with the bulk of the reinforcement. 
For that, we're going to be using our 450 gram 2212 from our stock range of materials. But as mold making isn't really that critical on the spec of fiber that you're using, this would be a great opportunity to use up some of those offcuts you might have or unwanted material. Alternatively, it might be worth taking a quick look at our wholesale section on the website where we very often have discounted material that might have been end of run from a large aerospace project. With regards to thickness, you're going to be in the range of two to 10 millimeters for carbon tooling. Two millimeters might be for very small components, um, whereas 10 millimeters might be a mold for a chassis. Uh, this particular mold, around about four or five millimeters is going to be appropriate to give a good, stable, stiff mold. So I'm going to be laying down eight plies of 450 gram onto the back of this. Fusion Fix spray adhesive is ideal for positioning these backing plies and using it on these later layers won't have any effect on the mould surface. With all of our layers of 450 gram reinforcement down now, I'm going to finish up with a final layer of 210 gram. The reason for that is it's going to balance the laminate. We've got a 210 gram down on the surface and in putting one on the back, we're going to create a sort of structural symmetry. That way, if there is any performance difference between the two different fibre types, they'll balance each other out and the moulds will stay flat and true. Now, in practice, in this example, I don't think it's likely to have any significant impact but it is always good to follow best practice. I have the material on hand, so I'll lay that down now. With the last layer positioned, the entire stack of fiber can be trimmed of any excess material. With all of our reinforcement down, we can now go on and set up for the infusion. Now the standard way of doing this would be to put down a peel ply and then follow that up with an infusion mesh. And this is the way you will have seen us set up infusions in most of our previous videos. But in this project, I'm choosing to use the ML3, which is a multi-layer product. Now this you can essentially think of as a mesh and a peel ply combined into one material. And being just one material, it does make laying it into the mold that little bit quicker and neater. But probably its main advantage comes in the tear down at the end of the process. For anyone who's done infusion, you'll know that tearing the mesh and the peel ply can be quite difficult. But this does release much more easily, and you'll see that a little bit later on. Just like working with conventional peel ply and mesh, it is really important that you ensure that this covers all of the areas of your molding. Now you can have overlaps in this material, that's no problem, it will still tear out fine, but you want to ensure that you don't have any gaps. Now it will follow moderate compound curves reasonably well, but if you do have any sharp, intricate or detailed areas, you might need to put a few cuts into it and this will just allow it to conform more easily. The resin connector and feed spiral can then be attached. As this is a mold and has a thick laminate, print through from these will be unlikely, but it is acceptable if it does occur. This allows me to position these in the center, which wouldn't be an option for thinner cosmetic components. For the vacuum connections, I'm going to use MTI hose. This line has a breathable but resin-proof membrane that will maintain vacuum to the dry areas of the mold. If you want further information on how to use the MTI and other membrane products, we have done a video covering this specifically, which we'll link to in the description. I'll also include links to another video that goes into much more detail on the general setup and theory of the resin infusion process. With everything set up and in place, the mold can then be bagged up as normal with the VB160 film. As my reinforcement is very close to the seal, I'm only peeling the backing off a small amount at a time and then securing the film down. This reduces the likelihood of a fiber dropping across the seal. The resin feed hose can then be connected and the vacuum lines clamped. The MTI hose restricts airflow, so for the initial drawdown, I will connect the vacuum to the feed line and then swap them over later and perform a drop test. For information on getting a perfect seal and performing drop tests, take a look at our vacuum bagging video linked in the description. Now that we've got our infusion all set up, we're ready to go on and mix up our epoxy. The resin that we're going to be using is our EL160 high temperature epoxy. And this, after a post cure, will mean that these molds are going to have a surface temperature of up to 160 degrees C, which is really quite high and means that they're going to be suitable for nearly all composite cure cycles. But if you don't need that high temperature performance, there's no reason why you can't do this exact same process using the conventional IN2 infusion epoxy. 
you're just going to be limited to cure cycles that are either ambient or very low temperature. Now, if you are already familiar with processing the IN2 resin, the main difference that you'll find between that and the EL160 is viscosity. The EL160 is a thicker resin, and so it will flow more slowly. Typically, I find that it's about half of the speed for an average infusion. Now, you can compensate for this by reducing the distance between your flow lines, so maybe rather than running them at a meter separation, you halve that to half a meter, and that's going to sort of bring your infusion times into something much more reasonable. Another method you can use is to run the infusion under temperature. So you can load all of this into an oven at a relatively low temperature of 40 degrees C, and that will massively reduce the viscosity of the resin, and you'll start to get some very, very quick infusion times. The resin itself is mixed in the same way that you would any other conventional epoxy. After the resin has been accurately weighed and fully mixed, the feed line clamp is undone and the resin is drawn into the mould. Even at room temperature, the flow rate of the EL160 is still very good and this entire mould was infused in about 20 minutes. With the infusion completed, we're now ready to go on and conduct the initial cure. Now with the EL160 being a high temperature resin, it is important to do this at a slightly elevated temperature of 40 degrees C. If you weren't to do this and just cure it at room temperature, the resin will be quite brittle, meaning if you were to try and release the mold from the pattern, it's likely to crack and chip out. So there are two ways that we can conduct the initial cure. Firstly, we could just leave this to cure at room temperature for 24 to 48 hours, and then place the entire pattern and mold into an oven and cure it for a further 24 hours at 40 degrees. Or alternatively, and like we're going to do today, immediately after infusion, load the whole lot into the oven and conduct the initial cure at 40 degrees for 24 hours. So we're now 24 hours later after that initial cure at 40, and a good indication to see that the resin has cured sufficiently to allow release is that it should feel very tough in the resin feed lines here and not crack and break easily. As you can see, that's very tough, so let's get this torn down. The ML3 multilayer is very easy to remove when compared to a conventional peel ply and mesh stack. I find that simply sliding a few wedges between it and the part will quickly separate them, normally in one piece. So if you do have a hard time removing the mesh from your mouldings, it might be worth giving this material a try, as it really is a time saver. Releasing a stiff mould from a stiff pattern can take some patience, but in this case, a few wedges driven around the tapered sidewall quickly pop them apart. With the mould released from the pattern, we can now go on and conduct a post-cure. Now this secondary stage of the cure cycle is absolutely essential to realise the full service temperature that this resin system can offer. And the process of a post-cure is to just gradually increase the temperature that the mould's exposed to. And as this is happening, you will be further curing the resin in the mould itself. Now, you only need to do this up to the service temperature that you need. So if you're going to be using these moulds at, say, 120 C, you would need to post-cure to 120 or maybe 130 degrees. But if you did want to realise the full service temperature that the resin can offer, you would go all the way through to 160 C. Now, the very important thing when you're doing this is to not increase the temperature too quickly. It has to be a very gradual ramp. If you were to just place these straight into an oven at elevated temperature, you're going to excessively soften the resin. And that's likely to lead to excessive print through on the surface and could potentially lead to warping and distortion as well. But even if you are following the recommended gradual ramp rate, you are going to be very slightly softening the resin throughout this cure. So for that reason, it is very important that you properly support the molds. Now we have a sort of planar surface on this mold. So to support it is simply a case of laying it down onto a flat surface. In the case of multi-part moulds, you should bolt these together as that way they're going to stay accurately aligned to one another. Either way, it's important that it's properly supported so that you don't sort of introduce any twist or warp and then freeze it in place with the post-cure. Now you might be wondering at this stage, why not conduct the post-cure on the pattern? That's going to keep it flat, level and true. Well, the problem here comes once again down to CTE. 
the thermal expansion of the pattern is likely to be much higher than that of your mold. So during the post-cure, it's going to expand inside your mold tooling. That can lead to pre-release, warping, or even damage to your tooling. So that's the reason that you'll see nearly all of these elevated post-cures done off the pattern. Here I'm loading the mold into an oven and conducting the post-cure. In this case, it's a slow ramp up to 140 degrees C. Once the post cure is complete, the flanges can be trimmed and sanded flat and smooth. With the mould trimmed up, we could now put this straight into service. So we could put some release agent on here and start using the tooling. But if you look closely, we do have a very slight texture in the surface of the mould that's been left from the model board. So to get rid of that, I'm going to flat it down with 1200 grit wet and dry and then restore the gloss with some S120 sealer. The very slight texture is left from any remaining porosity in the model board. So once in the mold, they are in the positive. So flatting these out is a very quick process. After sanding, the mold gets cleaned with mold cleaner and then two coats of the S120 sealer are applied. In order to get a good even film from the S120, you need to wipe it in a linear pattern and not double back until it is cured. So let's take a look at the finish that we've managed to achieve. So the surface finish really is very good. We've got very little print through here and the S120 sealer has done an excellent job of putting the gloss back onto that flatted out surface. Now if you did want an even higher level of gloss, remember that you can use the EG160 gel coat in conjunction with this process to provide you with a polishable surface. But that will also come at a slight compromise to the dimensional accuracy and stability of the mould, which is why we chose not to use it in this project. So there we have it, that's our finished high temperature resin infused mold. Using the resin infusion process, we've produced a mold that's durable, dimensionally stable, and can be used at temperatures up to 160 degrees C, whether that's for curing prepregs in an oven or an autoclave, or any other process involving a high temperature cure. The low temperature initial cure of 40 degrees C meant that a wide variety of pattern materials could be used and they would undergo minimal expansion further adding to the accuracy achieved. All of this is really made possible by the set of properties that the EL160 resin can offer. It's infusible at room temperature, has a long pot life, has a low initial cure temperature, and then a very high final service temperature. If you have any questions about using this process in your mold production, do get in touch. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. All of the equipment and materials that you've seen used in this video can be ordered online from the Easy Composites website. If you're based in the EU, you can now order directly from our Netherlands warehouse on easycomposites.eu and for the UK and the rest of the world, please visit easycomposites.co.uk.